As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Goodfellas was very special. I was looking for something that uh, I could find another way of dealing with genre. And I think really that's what started to get me really interested in it, the characters in the world that it depicted in a genre that I've kind of felt most comfortable with over the years. There's something about the underworld has more to do with a kind of uh, a working class or lower working class existence from where I come from. And so it's natural for me. A lot of his films, and especially with Goodfellas, definitely deal in the underworld. And that's been a, a recurring theme in a lot of his work. And I think people are attracted to that, but more so the fact that he's always trying to grasp the humanity of these people, the flawed nature of these characters. When you think of, of gangster films up to that point, you don't really get a chance to pull back that curtain and see the day-to-day -day life of these guys. And in Goodfellas, it, it moves the genre into a, into a new place. None of us are gangsters to begin with, you know. Um, Marty certainly is not, Robin isn't, and I'm not, and wasn't. Um, we grew up in certain environments, Marty and Robin, as you know, in Little Italy, me in Brooklyn. So the gangster issue is almost a non-issue. We could have been playing doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs. So this was not about the essence of gangsterism, but it took place in the milieu of the gangster. But these were people who were trying to know themselves find out about themselves, be themselves, as Marty was. As any actor, not just me or Leo or I think Daniel Day-Lewis would say that they love Marty because he's very easy and, and encouraging in what it is and then guides you in what, what he wants. You know why it stands the test of time? Because it's truthful. Marty, who's really a, a great director, there's just an enthusiasm. The actors also come from that world. Bob certainly knows that world, and Joe, and I think it lends an authenticity. Marty is able to surprise you constantly. Marty never is interested in the the villain or the hero. He's interested in where most people are, which is in the middle. You know, people always say, well, interested in the antagonist in my movies. Well, the point is that they're also human. These are also parts of the negative parts of who they are. Uh, evil streak, so to speak, if you want to use that phrase, is also maybe something in us and something not to be afraid of, but to explore and to try to understand. What do you do? What? What do you do? I'm in construction. I don't feel like you're in construction. No, I'm a union delegate. I saw a documentary he did about his mother and father called Italian American. And I just, I said, oh my God, there is something to be said in that world, like in Goodfellas. That world is something that deals with very basic conflicts, uh, basic uh, dilemmas, moral dilemmas, that I grew up with, and so I feel comfortable with it. He's told me, and his mother has told me, that uh, if there was going to be a mafia killing on the street, they would, the mothers would all be told, take your children off the street at 3 o'clock, and, and then they would all come in, and then somebody would be shot, and he would go back out to play again. I think they just reflect aspects of who we are as human beings, and some things we can't deny or pretend they don't exist. That's the idea. That's very dangerous, because when it, if you're teaching younger people, when they suddenly shock to find out it does exist, no, it exists. You know, I just want to get you prepared. I don't know how it's going to come at you, but it's going to be there, because that's part of who we are. One of the reasons Goodfellas does work uh, is because there is a sense of comradeship, that these guys, although they're all terrible guys, they all, you all want to hang around with them. And then suddenly, when, when Joe Pesci kills Spider, they're not so nice. In fact, that's where we had, we had a big, big fight with Warners about, uh, about that. They wanted us to remove the Spider uh, killing. And we had to very, very forcefully explain to them that that scene uh, really changes the audience's attitude about our friends. That up until then, everything is nice. They hang around at nightclubs, they got nice girlfriends, they spend money. Uh, and it all sounds like Goodfellas are a bunch of really nice guys until the spider murder, where you see these really are terrible people. Uh, but Marty was smart enough to get you hooked early on, so you like him. We had Henry Hill. We had 
all those people. We had guys who knew all of these people. And they, you'd drink with them and you'd talk to them and you, they were very, very funny. And they were always trying to put one over on the other one and always in, with good spirits. I mean, they're, and then, ah, I gotcha, I gotcha. When you get a guy who has actually been in prison and done bad stuff and is a half a wise guy or a wise guy, that face is different than most faces. You can see it, and Marty sees it too, and he fills movies with that kind of stuff. He can't make it a cliche. He knows everything. He knows if it's a cliche. He looks at an actor and he's like, oh, no, 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 no. I mean, I remember when we cast Goodfellas, we didn't want any old faces. Henry! Where were you? Why didn't you call? Where have you been? Mom. We were worried to death. A married man does not stay out like this. Mom! Don't, don't, stay out. Out. don't act like this! <laughs> when Marty wanted to cast Ray, I said, why, why Ray? We could do better. I kept saying, look at other people. Let's see who else is out there. And my wife went having dinner, and uh, Ray Liotta was in the restaurant, and he came over to my table, and he said, could I see you for a minute and talk to you? I had never met him. And uh, I said, sure. I got up from the dinner table, and uh, we went outside. And he said, look, I know you've been resisting me playing the part. Uh, and then he went into a whole spiel about why he should have it. And he convinced me. And I called Marty the next day and said, you know what? I think you're right. Hire him. Marty probably would have beat me up and hired him anyhow, but uh, Ray convinced me. By the time I grew up, there was 30 billion a year in cargo moving through Idlewild Airport. And believe me, we tried to steal every bit of it. I was at the Venice Film Festival, and we're on the second floor, over looking down at the lobby, and there's just tons of people walking, walking around, just, you know, film festival, everything was busy. But all of a sudden, there was this group of, like, 20 people, like, all walking together. And I looked in the middle, I said, oh my God, that's Marty. I gave him a VHS, because it was back in 1986 or 87, gave it to him, just hoping that he would see it. The whole time, it took about a year, I think, from the time that I met him, then I went and met him again, but we never read. Never read, we just talked. What are you doing? You are leaving your car? Watch, it's a car for me. It's easier than leaving it out of the garage and waiting. A lot quicker that way. You know what I mean? Henry was still alive, but Marty didn't want me to meet Henry at all. So I said, okay, uh, so I won't. But what I did, I talked with Nick Pileggi, who, who uh, interviewed Henry. So Nick gave me hours and hours and hours of cassettes to listen to. You have to talk to the real people, and that's where you get all that little, that attention to detail, uh, that Marty just leaps on. He, that's, what he, that's what we want. And uh, uh, it just lends a, a reality to it. And why not? The people you're talking to are the real people. They really did it. Just give us the fucking money! Huh? I can't. I would just listen to the cassettes. I would just put it in, in my mother's car whenever I was driving around. Just listen to, to, to Henry you know, being interviewed by Nick. And it was, very, it was great doing it, but it was also, Henry, for some reason, he just ate potato chips the whole time while he was listening. And that chomping of the potato chips was kind of like insightful in terms of who he was and how he didn't care how he was coming across. He was just telling the stories uh, of his life. Congratulations. Here's your graduation present. Well, Never rat on your friends, and always keep your mouth shut. Bob found his character in little things by the watch, the jacket, the tie, the haircut. He feels the character. He knows who the character is, down to whether he's got manicured fingernails or not. The number one thing with any director, any good director, is you gotta, I mean, you gotta like make people feel that they, they can try anything. You know, a lot of times, especially in movies, you don't, talk about certain things or you maybe have a table read, sit around and talk about the, the general idea of, the, of scenes or the general idea of the movie or this and that. But in my experience, so I've done them in every which way, rehearsed, that sometimes you like to leave that until you actually do it. Bob, at one scene in Goodfellas when they're having <laughs> a breakfast, they got the body in the trunk of the car, that, and Bob was curious, when Jimmy Burke liked ketchup, and so he wanted ketchup on this Italian breakfast. Oh, uh, okay, get Jimmy to catch up. But Jim, Bob was curious, you know, how did he 
take ketchup out. Did Jimmy do that? Did he do that? Did he do that? How did he do it? And I got a hold of Henry and he says, Hi, Edward, Jimmy used ketchup. How did he do it? He says, Oh, he did it that way. And so in the movie, Bob does it that way. And I watched it. I said, Ooh, I just gave it an authenticity to detail. In all the movies that we've done together, there's always humor, even though there are dark sides. But a lot of humor comes out of those ironic sort of dark moments, certain things, especially with, uh, in movies that Marty makes. The scene with the mother when they're all having breakfast and they have a dead body in the trunk, you know. There were a lot of very, very funny lines that came out of there. The hoof, that's, that's one of the lines when he said, you know, Joe Pesci was just trying to, he couldn't remember the name for, the, for a hoof. And the way Bob says the hoof is something everybody remembers. It gets a huge laugh. We hit the deer and his paw, what do you call it? The paw. The paw. The paw. Big the hoof got caught in the grill. Oh. I got I to gotta hack it off. Ooh. Ma, it's a sin. You're going to leave it there, you know. So Anyway, I'll, I'll bring your knife back after that. Anyway. Delicious. Delicious. Thank you. There's something about De Niro who understands the humanity of all kinds of people and could really uh, express that. Uh, we had same, similar interests. He knew where I came from. I knew where he came from. He, he understood the area I grew up in. And I just think that they reflect those dilemmas, those conflicts, uh, that behavior. I think Maury tells his wife everything. Maury, him? That's when I knew Jimmy was gonna whack Maury. That's how it happens. That's how fast it takes for a guy to get whacked. What? Where's my fucking drink? I asked you for a drink. You wanted a drink. I just asked you for a fucking drink. No, I thought I thought you said that you were all right, Spider. Huh? I thought I am. Um, I thought you uh, you've been doing this all I fucking night said. to me, you motherfucker. Joe's just—he's a funny guy. Uh, he was just funny in it, just the way that character was and what Joe brings to it. That scene in uh, uh, "I Make You Laugh." Uh, you know, I didn't write that. I get credit for that all the time. People want to give me awards. Oh, well, you wrote that. I never wrote that. Joe made it up. Joe had seen that actually happen because Joe has been around. He's gone in joints. He knows people. He saw some wise guy do that to another wise guy. You're a funny guy. <laughs> what do you mean? You mean the way I talk? What? It's just, you know, you, it's, you're just funny. It's, it's funny, you know, the way you tell the story and everything. Funny how? When Joe told the story that, that it happened to him about you're a funny guy, except he was on the receiving end of it, uh, we then improved it for a while in rehearsal and then locked it in. And then it would die down and I said, you really are a funny guy. And then Joe came on and then we improved again and, and they kept that. So Joe does it, of course, is one of the most brilliant things in the movie. And it was all Joe improvising. And of course, a lot of the guys standing around had no idea it was Joe was going to improvise at that point. So there were a lot of those reactions were absolutely pure. You know how you tell a story? What? I couldn't stand him. I thought he was really obnoxious. He kept fidgeting around. You don't mind, do you? It's very annoying. East Coast women are a whole different type of woman than someone you might find in the Midwest. And, and Lorraine is just, she's a very confident person who definitely has her likes and dislikes and, and opinions, and she's not afraid to let you know it. And I guess maybe that was one of the things, I, I guess she was modeling it after Karen, Henry's, Henry's wife. You got some nerve standing me up. Nobody does that to me. Who the hell do you think you are? Frankie Valley or some oh. kind of big shot? Lorraine is very, very smart and knows that world. I mean, she's, she grew up, she's, I don't remember, I think she's Brooklyn. She's a Brooklyn girl. And she just, I mean, she grew up with those girls. She knows who they are. She knows every one of them. And she knows everything about them. My favorite thing about Marty was that I came with things. And he never made me feel stupid or embarrassed of an idea or an action. The guys used real money. So I said, well, I want real jewelry. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I want the real thing. It makes me feel different, better, you know, snazzier. I, you know, I like that. I ended up wearing white jeans instead of blue jeans because Marty felt there was a huge distinction between mob characters and real life. And I fought a lot with Marty 
in saying she's 28 years old, she's 32 years old, she's, she's not old school. And so we did a lot of, uh, I did a lot of battling for Karen. I think she was able to just channel into that character brilliantly. I mean, it's an amazing performance. I really kind of asked Marty to put my kids in the movie because I'd worked so hard I hadn't seen them. And I was like, well, my kids are that age. And um, it was like, yeah, okay, all right, bring the kids in. <laughs> I think the only time I really said to myself, oh, what was I thinking, was when I go and ring the doorbells and I'm a little out of control and um, I'm dragging Stella and she's looking at me like, why are you screaming? My mother acts in a number of films, particularly in uh, Goodfellas in 1989, 1990. Um, and to her, she perceived it as um, my son's making a film and these are my uh, son's friends. It wasn't De Niro, it wasn't Joe Pesci, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, you know, uh, the level of... Uh, uh, these incredible actors, uh, it was literally my son's friends. They knew each other very well, you know, Katie had cooked endlessly for them. So they were very comfortable all together, and all Marty does is he just turns his mother on. He says, action, that's it. And then everyth anything goes then between all of them, and we got these wonderful lines, and then at one point, the only direction he gave her was, pick up the painting, mother. Right, so she picked up the painting and then she improvised the great lines, just amazing. One dog goes one way and the other dog goes the other way. One is going east and the other one is going west, so what? And this guy's saying, what do you want from me? The guy's got a nice head of white hair, look how beautiful with the dog, it looks the same. He would never really direct her, he would just put her in the scene because he knew she was the perfect thing to make Bob and Joe uh, improvise together. Why don't you get yourself a nice girl? I get, get a nice one almost every night, ma. Yeah, but get yourself a girl so you could settle down. That's what I, I mean. settle down almost every night, but then in the morning I'm free. I love you. <laughs> I want to be, be with you. I'm not a director who could do a theater piece out of Eugene O'Neill or Shakespeare. There may have been a time I could have, but what is that? Is that my experience, really? And I found it over the years to be more comfortable to be dealing with what I... I think is something of my experience. He feels that if you lecture people, if you wag their finger at them and make moralistic uh, sort of sermons, nobody listens. But if you immerse people in the environment and you make them understand why it's attractive to want to be in it, then you make the terrible decision to be in it and then you pay for it. If it's uh, three men in a social club having espresso, I know that. I know that. What? What can I mine that is newer there for me? What can I find that that is um, worth me doing, uh, worth me spending my time on it? I don't know yet. There might be more. And then there was Mo Black's brother, Fat Andy, right and his guys, Frankie the Wop, Freddie No Nose. What was important about that shot in Goodfellas? was that it was like the, uh, the nostalgia of a world filled with gods. This guy who had been up there with the gods up in, up in Olympus and then was cast down. It's kind of comfortable at times to, to do stuff that you feel you intrinsically know. What I mean is know at least in terms of body language, um, dialogue, no dialogue, looks. Hi, right, Mom, what do you think? My shoes, aren't they great? My God, you look like a gangster. Well, the clothes are very important to Marty, and the dress parade, as when the actors are brought before him to be checked, he was very obsessed about the collars that the mafia wear, where they're almost closed over the tie, and only his mother and father could could actually press those collars properly. So Marty would reject actor after actor who didn't have the right pressed collar, and they would be sent back, and his mother would properly iron it. He tied my tie every day. The way he wanted the knot was very specific and I guess from when he was growing up and every day he would tie my tie and, and, and get, the, uh, get the knot right. 
I think he, you know, he's very careful to make sure that it's believable. You know, he's all, he'll often say to me in dailies, I don't believe that, I don't believe that. Paulie had this wonderful system for doing the garlic. He used a razor and he used to slice it so thin that it used to liquefy in the pan with just a little oil. It's the beautiful evocation of food. And he loves, for example, very tight shots of keys being put into locks and, or doorknobs being turned, because there are things that we do a thousand times a day but aren't ever celebrated in quite that way. They're distilled images, and they have a meaning. They have a real meaning for us but that we don't even realize because we do them so many times a day. There are incredible shots of the gun, for example, you know, that are un incredibly framed and become sort of otherworldly. At one point, the, the cock on the gun looks like a bird. I mean, it's weird, but Marty was shooting and framing so beautifully, and they're so beautifully lit. Uh, things like that really in, in, enhance the power of the scene of, of uh, the wife holding the gun on her husband <laughs> because of his infidelity. Wake up. Do you love her? Do you? <laughs> Karen. Karen. I love you. You know I love you. <laughs> so Karen. It all happens in Marty's head. When we were writing, there's that scene where Bob De Niro is standing at the bar with a cigarette, and he's looking at Manny, and he's going to kill him. And you know he's going to kill him. And Marty has this shot, and he gets closer and closer and closer, and Bob's eyes get more wolf-like. It was just the most terrifying picture. And as I'm typing that stuff, because I'm the typist, he says, put in cream, put in cream. I said, what cream? He says, just write, write down cream. I said, right, what's, what cream? Who are you talking about? Just put it, just put it, put it, put it. Do me a favor, just put it. So I typed in cream. Well, it turns out, while we're typing that scene, he's already listening to the music. So now... You can't, I can't interpret that, I can't tell you where that, it's all intuitive, it's all part of whatever comes out of him. Now I look at that scene, when I see it, it's just, it's an amazing scene with that music and that close-up of Bob. Conway, uh, the De Niro character, he decides at that point, being annoyed by all these people around him asking for their cut of the job, the Lufthansa robbery and all that stuff, why should he give it to anybody? Why shouldn't he just keep it all for himself? The only way to do that is to give uh, his friend you know, Tommy, Joe Pesci's uh, character, a little sort of nod, wink, in a sense. You see that in his eyes, and we shot that, I think, at 32 frames a second or 36 frames, just to get, I don't know. I didn't know what I was gonna get, but then when I saw the rushes, I saw that gleam in his eyes, and I synced that to the guitar from Sunshine of Your Love right to that point. Improvisation is important because it has to be done the, the right way, and Marty uh, that gets a, a certain spontaneity out of everybody. At the same time, he's got to mold it and shape it with some uh, direction. It has a direction, but it also needs his vision, his directing vision in it in the editing. As besides just on. on when we're right there. He's very focused. He's very determined. Uh, he knows what he likes. Um, he knows what he doesn't like, that's for sure. One of the great things about Marty is just an enthusiasm. And he gets so, he's so contagious and so excited. So to work with somebody who's that excited is just exhilarating. It, it, it's a lot of fun, but I had no idea. You know, this was only my fourth movie, so I was still kind of new, new to me. But the, the playing pretend, to work with people that are that uh, committed to it is, is exhilarating. It's, it's a lot of fun. I try to work with people who really want to do it, people who are really enthusiastic and want to be there. You know, if I'll get there in the morning or something and very tired and actor says hello, he or she comes up to me and they're all excited about what they're going to do and it, that's it. I just suddenly pick up on that and we sail, you know, because you never know what you're going to find. He's always been like that. That's what makes it fun because he'll say, yeah, yeah let's try this, or, yeah, sure, let's do it. And then he'll think of a way, maybe put a little more emphasis on that or let's make it cleaner and blah, blah, blah. So it's, it, that, that gives you the, the freedom, if you will, to not be afraid to try certain things. And then and he'll, he'll take it out in the editing if it's not working or he'll just direct you and say, let's 
maybe work on this, let's not use that, let's just kind of clean it up in a very easy way. And the, the lines from Goodfellas are quoted constantly by everybody. All of that humor and that unique way that people speak is, is really makes the film last. You know what I feel? I can't believe 25 years have passed. And anybody who gets to my age, they know what I'm talking about. I had no idea that uh, the movie would be received as well as I think it was, you know. When you do the movie, you do it and, and you have fun with it. My daughter saw it for the first time. Now, by this time, I'm letting her watch it on her own. I would let her have her own experience, so I'm behind her. So she thinks she's all alone in the room, and, and she's watching it and, and, and watching it, and, and the, the, the kid, and then the voiceover, and then uh, there's more acting, more acting, more acting, and then it cuts to the first time that you see me, and the voiceover kicks in. And I hear her saying to herself into the TV, she said, oh my gosh, will you shut up already? I mean, when Godfellas opened, uh, it was the opening night, and I'm there, Nora's with me, and Marty is sitting next to me, and Helen's on the other, and, and uh, finally it goes on, and it's Zigfield, and we're in black tie, and we're watching it, and I get, I get this elbow. I says, what? See, we should have cut that scene. That's, he's talking too much. We get, and there's Marty. We're in tuxedos. It's the opening night. You can't do anything. Forget it. Sit back and enjoy it. And he laughed, and we watched the rest of the movie. But even then, on the opening night, he's thinking about how he could play around with it, which Thelma just puts her hands up. She knows that's exactly who he is. And none of us expected, I don't think, that Goodfellas would become such a memorable movie. It, it's uh, become sometimes so many people's favorite movie. We heard stories Oh, 20 years ago, that people would go into the video store and they'd be trying to find something for the weekend, and then the mother would say, oh, let's just look at Goodfellas. <laughs> that was wonderful to hear. I remember being at a craps table, and I don't really know how to play craps, and all of a sudden, you know, the whole table's screaming, come on, Karen! <laughs> and I'm like, Karen, and then I realize, oh my God, all these people are calling me by, you know, Karen Hill, it made me laugh. It's embedded into our culture. I think the film holds up better now, uh, I mean, at least as well now as it ever has. I mean, it's, it's one of the great films of all time. Well, it's a world that's created, and then you kind of say, this is not a world I'm really familiar with, but I like. Goodfellas is one of those movies that whenever it comes on television, there goes my next few hours. I'm absolutely going to watch that. And that's what's so powerful about that movie in particular. And, and Marty's work for that, for that matter. There's something about the way he connects you as an audience member and envelops you completely into another world that you become entranced by it and the rest of the world dissolves away and that's the magic of really making movies. <laughs> it's like we're at somebody's, we're at a party together and we're hanging out. That's basically what this is. We try to get that, the joy of being with each other, really. And you could see it. You know, we always called each other good fellas. Like you'd say to uh, somebody, you're gonna like this guy, he's all right. He's a good fella, he's one of us. You understand? We were good fellas, wise guys. It was so exhilarating talking with somebody who's ten times more passionate than you are. A smile, but not as long. All right? Try one more. That's why he's so great. He enjoys it. He doesn't put a cap on his own, and he doesn't put a cap on yours. And that's what makes it a, a joyous experience as opposed to, you know, like just a job. <laughs> you, at least. <laughs> the credit belongs to Martin, or this would have been just another model. We wanted to counter the romantic image of the mafia and show not only what the pull is, but what that decision means. And that was his goal in that movie. If you touch her again, you're dead! This is what goes on. This is the doggy dog struggles of these people. Terrifying. I just know it from what I saw in the streets. And when I, was, when I saw it, when I lived it, I always said, oh, well, that's the way it should be on film.
when we were in Chicago doing um, The Color of Money, there was an article in New York Magazine that was an excerpt from the book. Having dealt with that world to a certain extent, I felt therefore I never really wanted to touch upon that world again. But I, I found that the, the style of the book was so interesting and I tried to say, boy, if I can make a film like the style of this book, because what's the point of making another gangster picture? There have been several books about mob bosses, but it was like getting a hold of a soldier in Napoleon's army. That's who I wanted. I wanted to know how it worked inside. Detail, detail, detail. Everything is detail. I was interested in the minutiae of how to live as a wise guy. I wanted to get into the, the frame of mind of a guy who works that way every day. And you also had the voice of Henry. So much of that book was just his telling the story. And Marty called, and he said, uh, hello? He said, yeah, my, my name is Marty Scorsese. He said, I'm a film director, a movie director, I think he said. And I, he said, do you know? I, and I said, I know who you are. And he said, well, I'm calling you because he said, I just read your book. And he said, I've been looking for this book for years. I said, well, I've been waiting for this phone call all my life. So he said, I want to do it. But he wanted to write it with me, but he couldn't make a deal with me. So he said, don't worry about it. The deal with you is on the phone now. We will make this movie. Don't you worry about anything else. I mean, all directors will work with writers and sort of make it their own. But I think in the, particularly the case of Goodfellas, it was so much about the world that he understood that he really wanted to um, put his sort of stamp on it. I hadn't put my name on a script since Mean Streets, and I wanted to create an exhilaration of that kind of life. But he was stuck with somebody who didn't know anything. So he really had to bring me along, I think, as far as film is concerned. And um, I was a willing pupil because it was fascinating. And he's a great teacher. Now, when you're working with Marty, of course, he already sees the movie. I didn't, but it was all right. He brought me along. You know, I did most of the typing, I don't know, but he writes longhand. So I would type and then it would come out and then he would scratch these little things on it. And we would work on it and, we'd, and, and the dialogue would be bounced back and forth between us. So we would, we would develop scene after scene. In this scene, this is what's going to happen. Then we go to this. And he also said, put in the corner, put in the corner, and he would mention a piece of music. I want that music here. What really was, was important was the nature of the relationship between the main character and the audience. And that's the experiment with voiceover. To us, those goody good people who work shitty jobs for bum paychecks and who took the subway to work every day, worried about their bills, were dead. I mean, they were suckers. They had no balls. I think it's a wonderful way to tell a story of a film. But so many times I think voiceover is used to patch a little crack in the script, you know, and, and, it's, it, and then it, it sort of doesn't work. You need a body of material so that you have enough richness of character to be able to justify the voiceover. Because the narrative of that part is not important. It's the language. It's the, it's the web that he's spinning as, as a personality. He's getting you to like him. And that's the danger of the character. The other thing we did was a straight chronology. And that's the way the first draft is written. And then Marty was looking at it. He said, you know, it's a little slow. We have to do, the, this is a movie. We've got to do something. We've got to hook up. He loved the idea, always loved the idea of these guys driving around with a guy they think is dead in the back of the car that's still alive. Because the moment of that Billy Bats murder is the, where everything changes for them. The fuck? And so rather than going from the young boy directly to the ending, the rise and fall, which is, it is uh, just very traditional rise and fall, but we wanted to give it something extra. So we took that out of the middle of the book, put it in the front, and he says, when he, they kill him, and then they put the trunk down, then I'll freeze on Ray Liotta looking out, and then bam, you're in the movie. Marty was lucky in this case, he got to just pick the person that was right for the role. You know, Bob and, and Joe Pesci were sort of obvious from the start. And Ray just had the qualities. He was believable. Goodfellas was my fourth movie. I had heard about uh, the book. I had picked it up just by accident one day just to have something to read from New Jersey to L.A. Read it, really liked it. Heard they were going to make the movie. And I met Marty. And I would meet him every now and then. But it was a long, long process. It was extremely nerve-wracking. And then maybe eight or nine months later, I finally landed it. Henry's character is somebody who is very, grows up with these guys and is very much a part of them, but he's slightly outside of it. And that was part of the quality that Ray has always had. That's why I think he was so perfectly cast. You would never have bought uh, the Bob De Niro character or the Joe Pesci character doing it, but you did buy Ray's character doing it. You need Henry. You don't need me, right? 
He asked me to come and meet him. And then he asked me to come up and read with Ray. Just right from the beginning, you know, I trusted her, she trusted me, and we were kind of like, you know, the new kids on the block. And Marty, he always called us the kids, Ray and I. Bring the kids out, you know, it was always very cute. Well, think about it. Of yeah. course you help. Gonna make it up. Yeah. Yeah. Of course you a lot. So we had a commitment towards each other and, and, and something that we were both going through at the same time, a newness to the situation. Watch this suit. Watch this suit. Watch this suit, Jesus you little Christ. frick. Yeah. Frank Vincent is like part of the team. You know, he, he's been in other movies and he's been in movies since. And when I came in to meet with him for this, he said, uh, what do you want to play? And I said, I want to play uh, Paul. He said, don't play Paul. Play Billy Bats. You don't argue with Marty. You say, no, I want to play this. If he says to play, he says, listen to me, play Billy Bats. I said, okay, Marty, whatever you want to do. And that's how it was cast. At that moment, I did not know what Billy Bats was going to be. So it actually was really a gift because everybody I know that I ever see or meet knows about it. And I did 40 movies. So that's got to be the standout. So, you know, he was perfect for Paul. I wasn't. That I didn't think I could do it because it was not the kind of role that I felt I really had an affinity for. The externals were easy, a middle-aged Italian man. The difficulty was in the lethality that I felt I didn't possess. And so even though I wanted to do it, I was sort of faking when I went to the meeting and giving Martin the impression that I knew exactly what to do with it when I had no idea what to do with it. But I wanted so much to be in a Scorsese movie. I guess he just figured I was capable of it. I had done so much homework. I was just obsessed with it. I knew it front, well, you know, I remember I was at home in Jersey. Nick Pelleggi had tapes of Henry. I remember putting the, 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 the cassettes in my mother's car and as I would drive to New York, we listening to him tell a story as he chomped on potato chips. And my dad would say, stop studying, get out and do something. I was just, it was, I knew it was a, it was a great opportunity and I did not want to be a week or so into it and you know Marty says you know I'll come to the trailer I don't know if this is where I just really wanted to play make-believe with these guys and you know again I didn't want to mess up I believed I could be Karen and and do Karen justice you are nothing but a horse is this the superintendent I knew the motivation of jealousy and wanting to hold on to her man and I understood those things right. keep coming See, Jimmy was one of the most feared guys in the city. The author, uh, Nick Pelleggi, was, uh, had a lot of information, research material that he had discarded from the book. And I also um, would um, talk to uh, uh, people who I thought would have some connection or some relevance to this particular character. Well, he wanted to talk to me about uh, the Jimmy Conway character, so... Uh, you know, I mean, there was some, some mornings that we talked four or five times. He'd be in his trailer before he'd go in front of the camera, you know, get me on a phone and... Uh, he would call you four or five times a day? Would, you know, in the mornings before he would... Wow. Uh, you know, how does Jimmy hold a cigarette? Uh, how do you think he reacted, uh, you know, when he seen uh, Johnny Rose Beef, uh, you know, pull up with the Cadillac, and how he held a shot glass, you know, what kind of a face he made. <laughs> I mean, all of these crazy, you know, I mean, I thought they were crazy questions at the time. But, you know, and I started to get the hang of it. And, you know, I knew what he was requesting and, you know, and I was able to, you know, participate, you know, and, and it, uh, it was rewarding and, and I got paid for it. And uh, it went, it was about two months uh, in preparation to try to get this quality that I knew it called for. And I was kind of agonizing over it for a couple of months. I was thinking I'm going to ruin this movie. I was looking for something to get out of it. Until two days before we started production, by virtue of constantly searching to find where that kind of quality that killers have. Uh, I was preparing to go out one night, uh, passed by the mirror to check for spinach in the teeth, and uh, I jumped back. I, I literally frightened myself. I saw a look in my eyes that frightened me. And who was that? I said, that's Polly. And once I found it, the role became just a duck in water. It just was so easy to do. That what Paulie and the organization does is offer protection for people who can't go to the cops. That's it. That's all it is. They're like the police department for wise guys. So much of what Scorsese does is in the way he directs. Uh, and so you see something entirely different up on the screen often than is in that script. If I felt a scene could be opened up, I usually did that with the actors in rehearsal. So we would rehearse 35, 40 minutes a scene. 
uh, and they were all improvisations. They were very loosely around the script, just sort of what, would, what was happening, not improvising by writing lines. I mean, improvising behaviorally. He always says, don't act like these people. Behave like them. You know me. I would like to help you out. I oh, hope so. Sonny, tell him what we talked about. He gave me a fabulous direction uh, for Karen. He said, she's the movie star. She's the star, you know, of Henry's life. He knows so well what actors need and how to help them. And then he'll see something he likes and he'll come over and say, you know, um, you know what you said in that other improvisation? Why don't you say that to him again? Or, or um, let him have it. Now go home and get your fucking shine box. Motherfucking hey, mutt! You, come you come fucking come piece of shit! He uses the power of the verb. Acting is doing something. I threaten, I charm, I beg. And what Martin does in the improvisation is encourage the doing of things. Well, that merely means stay with the other fellow and deal with what he's giving you. What are you, stupid? What's the matter with you? I apologize. What's the matter with you? Sorry. What the fuck is the matter with you? You feel like you're a real collaborator. He makes you feel that way. And in a certain sense, you are, because you're giving all the good things that you have. And you see anybody fucking around with this shit you're going to tell me, right? Yeah. That means anybody. He knows what he wants to do, but you really feel like you're creating and he's letting you go uh, to do what, what, what you've come up with. That's just the way he is. He, he's very open to a lot of uh, ideas from anybody. That was for an actor. It was like the jackpot. So even during the improv, once we had the improv down, then we had to lock it. You don't improvise on camera when we're shooting. They all think that Marty just doesn't do anything, that he lets the actor say, okay, go ahead, and he sits there like this, you know, and, and enjoys it, you know. It's not true, I mean, it's so crazy to think that you can go in there and make a movie like that. It has to be structured. You're still saying a script. I said, all right, I'll tell you something, go fuck your mother. <laughs> Probably the uh, most memorable improvisation I've ever seen was the Joe Pesci uh, uh, Ray Liotta improvisation at the nightclub. I'm funny how? I mean, funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you. Which is something that actually happened to Joe years ago, in reality. And so Marty said, oh, well, we must put that in the film. I make you laugh. I'm here to fucking amuse you. And that was very carefully worked on. Within our rehearsal period, I was able, as a, the co-writer, to record several takes, maybe four to five takes, between Ray and Joe of this dialogue. I then took that and rewrote that which was then inserted into the script. Funny how? I mean, what's funny about it? <laughs> it was interesting how he shot that sequence. He's shooting it in a medium shot, not in a close-up. And the reason, and I always tell film students this, that it's very important, is that, first of all, he knew the scene was powerful enough that he did not need close-ups. And secondly, what he really wanted to show was how the people around Joe Pesci and Ray Liotta were gradually changing the looks on their faces as, as the sense of dread began to creep into what was supposed to be a casual conversation and suddenly it is wonderful how you see their faces change and he was very adamant that that's how he wanted to shoot it. Oh, oh Anthony, he's a big boy, he knows what he said, what'd you say? Right. Funny how? And you just watch his body language and you know it's dead serious and it could turn on a, a split second. But hard to cut. Marty and I spent a long time figuring out how long to wait until Ray Liotta actually says, come on, Tommy. Funny, what the fuck is so funny about me? Tell me, tell me what's funny. Get the fuck out of here, to Tommy. <laughs> you motherfucker, I almost had him. I almost had him. You stuttering prick here. Frankie, was he shaking? <laughs> And all the laughter you hear on the track is me and them and everybody was there, right? Because we have to create an atmosphere of, of, of that kind of a moment on the set. When something accidental happens, delightful that an actor does, he'll burst out laughing as, as an audience. And it's, it's a wonderful thing to see, very refreshing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good, good. We... <laughs> jokes. <laughs> you can thrill him by giving him a good performance. And to watch, watch someone You'd be thrilled while you're doing something is the best thing for an actor. He has an amazing sensitivity to body language and how an actor is conveying a certain idea with just a slight flicker of, of an eye or uh, something very subtle, and he's reacting to it all the time. And he goes like this. No more, give me more, give me more. Girl, girl, girl. No, 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 easy, easy, easy. 
And then when you do it after the take, say, good, that was good. That was good out loud. You hear his voice. Good. That was good. I think Marty is probably one of the most prepared directors I've worked with. In the case of Goodfellas, he was working with Michael Ballhouse, who is also incredibly prepared. The good thing about Marty is that really he has this movie in his head already. So the way we work together is that I looked at his shot list. Um, then we look at the locations together and we figure out if his shots would work on a location like this or that. So there is no discussion actually on the set anymore. I mean, we talk about shots, but it's not like we're trying to figure out what it's gonna be. So we know what's gonna be. There are many times that we didn't do any coverage at all. What that scene was, I never knew. I, had, I was clueless. I'd never even seen a steady cam. And that doesn't exist in the book, but it does in just a couple of lines, except a couple of lines in the book in the hands of the director, that's where you begin to see a nonfiction book in detail really blossom into a kind of art. The whole idea is that it had to be done in one take, so you don't feel that it was a series of cuts or that there was a separation between him and the world that he was trying to get into. The camera flowed through them and just glided through this world, just all, all the doors opened to him and everything just slipped away. It was like heaven. And then to emerge like a king and queen, this was the highest he could aspire to. It was kind of tricky also to get all the actions right because Marty is so very accurate about every single timing. You know, what the people do in the kitchen, the guy with the table comes at the right time and brings the table over. All these things are very important. But as far as I remember, we shot the scene only eight times and it was not even a full day. But we wanted it really in one shot and we got it in one shot. Take my wife, please. <laughs> Yeah, and he really knows every second of what you're doing. He's a, he, I mean, he's, you come to the set dress, he'll send you back because you like the tie. Yeah, he sees same. every same. detail. Uh, the kid doesn't look like a gangster yet. He has to look. His shoes are going to be shined. Got a pinky ring, kid? Yeah. Yeah, that's better. Mm -hmm. I would like that just a little bit. We don't have any stays in the collar? Yeah, this one doesn't call me. No stays, Christine? Mm -hmm. yeah, every little nuance in it means something to him and he made sure it was it was registering right well that gives that's that's the thing with marty because his films have really have a sense of reality and he understands it so well he knows when something is real and when it isn't marty would say no that doesn't feel right i feel right to you but the only way you can really be truthful about it is to really not be inhibited by anything what do you mean don't be like <laughs> I think it explains what the world is really like. And part of what's so interesting is that it starts out as a lot of fun. We're as bad as they are. We're happy to see the postman go in the oven. And all of a sudden, of course, when Spider gets shot, it all turns and it changes. Now he's moving. I mean, he shoots that poor kid in the foot. You should know then, these are not, this is not the way to live. You don't be sucked in by these guys, because it's only going to end one way before the witness protection program. It only ended one way. Death. It was the most frightening thing. I mean, I was out of my body for a minute, you know. I had to put myself in a frame of mind to really kill someone. I made them put full loads in the gun, in the 45, because I wanted to hear the echo. I wanted to feel the gun really kick like a real 45. The silence after the last shot rang out was more deafening than the gun. Now you're gonna dig the fucking thing up. You're gonna dig the hole. You're gonna do it. I got no fucking lime. You're no, gonna fuck do it. Fuck cares. I'll dig the fucking hole. I don't give a fuck. These were very, very intense individuals. I mean, this is what happened. They lived a very violent life and it was just part of their lifestyle. You're gonna pay. Just give us the fucking money! Huh? I can't. Marty wants you to figure things out yourself. He wants you to come to the film and you to look at it and decide how you feel about it. He doesn't want to tell you what to think. He wants you to experience it. You want fucko? You want something? Huh? Oh, hey! Ah! This is, in, in my view, the most violent scene I ever saw. There were no cuts in it and there was no tricks, nothing. You felt the violence right there. I think in Marty's movie there is an intensity which is very similar to Marty. I don't know if it's necessarily violence, but you never know what's gonna happen. 
believe it or not, some guys really think you're the real deal. I never forget one guy said to me, hey, he says, and how could you let that little guy beat you up like that? You know, and he says, what, 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 uh, what is with, uh, with, this, with that language? Who, what kind of talking is this? The F and this and F and that. You know, this guy wants to kill 25 people that we know about. That's how real people think it is. I'll pick up a shovel at my mother's house. I had a woman say to me, and it's a school teacher, educated woman, said to me one time, when they were in the house eating, how could you breathe in the trunk, she said to me. This is actually what she asked me. I said, I had a little straw and I put a hole in it. I learned something about that. It's very, very close to phobic in trunks. I don't get in trunks. I love watching Marty direct and, and being with the actors and with the crew. It's wonderful. But first of all, I don't have time to be there. And secondly, it does prejudice my eyes. I like to experience the film as it's being born and watch it every day with Marty. And uh, then my job is to help him sort of uh, make sure that that all ends up on the screen the way he wants it. When he's in the editing room, he can then relax and sit and just with complete and utter control finish making his movie. And a great deal of Marty's movies are made in the editing room, particularly The Last Day as a Wise Guy, as we call it. Last Day as a Wise Guy is, is a sequence that I think came together particularly in the editing room because we could, um, we found that we could express the state of mind that Ray Liotta was in at that time, being coked up and completely out of control. It was written in a lot of small montages, but it was never really visualized uh, on the script uh, the way you see it on film. For example, when Ray Liotta flunks the guns, the camera swish pans up to him. I just always enjoy all the strange jump cutting that we did, you know, uh, Ray Liotta making veal cutlets and, and how we just uh, jumped around and just experimented and just had a hell of a lot of fun uh, violating every rule there is. During the previews, I got annoyed. The audience got annoyed, so I made it even faster, more relentless in a way. We can make it even more jagged. We can make it more fractured. And so we started doing more jump cuts. What I love about it is the annoyance at having to go bring the guns to Jimmy, knowing damn well Jimmy's not going to buy them. Stop with those fucking drugs. They're making your mind into mush. That should put you in a position to say, what am I doing in my life? No, he's annoyed that I know Jimmy's going to make me bring this around. He's not going to want I'm going to put him back in the trunk. I'm going to have to go over here. I've got to stir the sauce. I swear this helicopter's following me, but that can pay attention to that. I think it is. No, it isn't. Picking up his brother. Drugs, coke, girlfriends. They're hiding guns in garbage pails. And it goes on like that. Everything seemed to be of the same importance. All the same level. He could not differentiate by that point. <laughs> Total madness. <laughs> That's Henry's life. You know, I know he's stoned, and this is his vision of it is that, but that was Henry's life. You know, we did our jobs, and, you know, we had great makeup, and they made us look all whacked out. But talk about music and editing. Everything, everything gonna be all right this morning. Let's go shopping. Marty had such great ideas about how to put music to, to some of those images. <laughs> Some of it he had already pre-planned. Some of it he just he put into it, it, the film in the editing room. Will you take part in he has a deep sense of how music should go with a film, and by that I don't mean that that uh, that it should go easily. Sometimes it's a shocking choice, uh, but it works like crazy. <laughs> I kind of see everything with music, especially the juxtaposition of the type of music you're listening to to the images that you see out the window, and that sort of thing. And I, I said, that's the way music should be in a movie. That was the first time I had ever seen anyone shot. You remember where you ever heard first? Oh, uh, I usually, yeah, I usually a piece of music. I remember when I first heard it. Where, you were with your mother in a butcher shop? Or... Yeah, yeah and um, he'll carry those pieces of music around for years and then suddenly find exactly the right place for that piece. Each shot was designed to certain bars of Layla. We had the music already played on the set to get the right rhythm for the movement or for the length of the scene. 
And when I got in the editing room, then I had to make sure that I was trying to get exactly what he wanted. He was very specific about how he wanted the music to cut. Let's try this. It's really on the way. Yeah. Right here. We're starting. Goodfellas was one of those films that uh, I felt we rode like a horse. It was so beautifully scripted and shaped by Nick Legge and Marty that it had its own energy, it had its own drive, and as Marty was laying it down, it just had an incredible feeling to it. So we were sort of riding it and trying to stay on top of it and stay ahead of it if we could, but it was so strong. It had such a rhythm. The movie has such an effect on people that no one expected. I mean, it's just such a, it's, it's just such a grip. What I found in my experience is that there are certain films that you don't preview, and certainly this is one, and that's when we got our head handed to us. When we took this in front of audiences, we got killed. The audience got really, in some cases, almost violent. We had maybe 40 walkouts in the first 10 or 15 minutes. When they were giving their cards back, they were like throwing their cards and, and writing profanities on them. The people who saw it from the studio at first, they, they, they could see how incredibly entertaining it was, what an amazing film it was, but they were nervous about the drugs. We had a lot of problems with them on the cut. They wanted to cut out the violence. Which was impossible because that's what the movie was about. So um, he did have to fight very hard for, for that and uh, it was, uh, Remarkable to watch him, his courage and his conviction, and the fact that he just would never give up, but was very good at explaining why it was important to retain the material. And uh, we're able to get the film that, that Marty had wanted on the screen. You know, when you're working on something like this, you, you just try to make it as good as you can. And even in the end, neither of us we will be still not totally satisfied. And I remember. <laughs> Literally at, at the opening of the movie, I think it was at the Ziegfeld or somewhere, and I'm sitting next to him. They got us in tuxedos, and we're sitting next to him. Thing goes up, and then all of a sudden, I get this elbow. And he says, "I told you, I told you, we should have. I know, I should have." And he started talking about editing. We think you think he was in the editing room. I said, "Marty, Marty, forget it. It's over. It's too late." And he laughed. But you know, even watching it on opening night, there's still things you can tweak and things you can deal with. I don't think he's ever gonna. Say, I've finally done it. This is perfect. You'll never hear that from him. What's a gangster movie? What's a real gangster movie? I don't care where you are, what it is. If you turn on cable and Goodfellas is on, you just never turn it off. You got money for that fucking commercial, you know? <laughs> This is American pop cinema at its most powerful. Yeah. <laughs> at its most raw, at its most visceral, at its most entertaining. <laughs> because it was unsentimental and unflinching and punched you right in the mouth. Oh, hey. And it was relentless. It is virtuosic filmmaking. It'll take the top of your skull off. Wow. You are in the hands of a master. Enjoy the ride. The movie opens up. Jimmy. What's up? What's up? Did I hit something? They're in a car, you hear banging. They open up the thing and there's this bloody mess. Joe Pesci has the butcher knife and sticks it in the guy. And it knocks you back in your seat and you're like, the first time you see this movie, you're like, what the fuck is this movie about? As far back as I could remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. I remember sitting behind these three 80-year-old women with gray hair, and I remember registering how violent the movie was at that point. It took me like two or three viewings before I really started to appreciate the movie. I'm funny how? I mean, funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you? I just remember being knocked on my ass, for lack of a better, <laughs> lack of a better term. I was really, really waylaid by the film, especially as an impressionable young filmmaker. But I just remember staggering out of the theater, and I, and I wasn't sure what I'd just seen. I just knew that it was extraordinary. Is it as good as Raging Bull? Is the question. Is it this? Is it that? I'm gonna take this. It's okay. Okay, yeah. I just need to pull it back. But it was the second time I saw it that I go, oh. 
Not only is this better than Raging Bull, this is just a complete masterpiece. And you don't really notice a film masterpiece the first time you see it. You could be moved or you can see it, but you can't totally know it. It was a glorious time. The wise guys were all over the place. Goodfellas is a classic American gangster film because it is telling a tale of the rise and fall of a criminal in the Italian underworld. In the best sense of gangster film, you gotta follow the bad guys, man. You gotta make friends with the bad guys. A real gangster movie should send you away making you feel like you don't want to be a gangster. You know what? That's cool watching the movies. I don't want to live it. Fucking move! Get easy! Don't move! Get easy! Looks like fun. I don't want to be a gangster. Just give us the fucking money! Huh? I can't. It's not glorifying it in a way like, oh, they're making huge amounts of money living in mansions like Scarface or... Which was or, a great film. Which is a great <laughs> film, too. Or, or like uh, The Godfathers, where it's almost like operatic, you know, it's, it's bigger than life. This one was more down and dirty and on the street level, probably the way it really is. Any problems, he goes to Paulie. Trouble with the bill, he can go to Paulie. Trouble with the cops, deliveries, Tommy, he can call Paulie. Yeah, whenever you're doing a, a story of, of criminals and gangsters, you, you are vicariously living that lifestyle. People are always fascinated by the edge or something dark and criminal. And you'd be bullshitting people to say you're not having fun exploring that world. <laughs> it was a classic story in that sense, though, of crime doesn't pay. And that's how, it, that's exactly how it ended. Bye-bye, dickhead. <laughs> Martin Scorsese was an Italian-American who grew up around these people and added a humanity to them and a personal side and an affection. Look, go inside, make yourself oh, no. comfortable. No, 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 I'll no, make you something to eat. Sleep. Everyone's reactions seem genuine and authentic and like, wow, this is how it would go down. What the fuck you looking at? Come on, make that coffee to go. Let's go. Hey, so cool, Joe. Come in. He makes you as an audience pay attention to the details that you would if you were in that moment. When they're talking about jail, all you know is how they cook the food. It's what's in their day-to-day -day life, what's exciting to them, is how they cut the garlic with a razor blade. These details are not made up. And by picking those details of the type of car, the type of suit he's wearing, that kind of stuff, locks you in to that world and makes you buy the whole thing no matter how crazy the story gets. It's almost, I think, Scorsese's documentary-like fixation on making sure that those things really breathe and are real. It was Michael's favorite. I was making ziti with the meat gravy and I'm planning to roll some peppers over the flames. And The movie also uses the device of a narrator. To me, it meant being somebody in a neighborhood that was full of nobodies. Voiceover narration can be an old, cliched, clunky kind of device until somebody reinvents it. Then I found out that the guy we roughed up turned out to have a sister working as a typist for the FBI. Who could believe it? And a guy telling you his story at the same time had the great detachment of watching his life fall apart on screen and yet still being able to comment on it. This is a guy who could stand back and yet still observe what's become of him. That's when I knew I would never have come back from Florida alive. It's a very subjectively told film where you feel like you're part of it. Thank you, sir. All right, see you later. Thanks. Even the big steady cam shot that enters the Copacabana was used to justify the way Lorraine Bracco's character felt as she was being introduced to this world and taken on this journey with this character. She was experiencing this for the first time, and you as an audience member were experiencing it too. You know. The high point of Henry's being a big shot is the Copa scene, and he's a star. Every time I come here, every time you two. It's really that character's entire lifestyle. It's going through the back door and winding up on top. That's the true kind of melding of theme and story and plot and character. It's the brilliant combination of all those things, and you see it seamlessly executed in that shot. Anthony, right in the front. Great, great. It's one of those movies where it's clearly a director in charge. You can see his vision, no doubt about it. Every shot of his movies, he commits to. No, he's an arrogant guy. I'll shoot this film the way a gangster would shoot this film. If I want to freeze a frame, I'll freeze it. If I want to go back in time, I'll go back in time. If I want to fraction the narrative, I'll fraction the narrative. Murder was the only way that everybody stayed in line. You got out of line, you got whacked. Everybody knew the rules. I think he breaks all the rules, which is what makes it so good. It's not even fair, no. What rules? There are no rules. You're a funny guy. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? You mean the way I talk? What? <laughs> 
it's just, you know, you, it's, you're just funny. It's... If you look at something in film called continuity, which is characters' hands matching from one frame to the next, the continuity is so all over the place, but it doesn't matter. You're so riveted. Eight to five on Cleveland. Look, look, I, I never had to pay the vigorous that he demands. Am I something special? They were able to figure out, you know, you don't need to see a guy drive from A to B. You can just get the point by just having the door close here and an open here. And also you had the actors respond to the camera. We paid off cops. We paid off lawyers, we paid off judges. It becomes a cocaine movie, too. And it, it becomes a cocaine paste movie. It becomes a paranoid movie. That third act is just paranoia, cocaine, and pasta sauce. I'm starting. I, I, listen, you know what to do? What does it feel like to be coked up and kind of losing it? And how does one convey that and portray that on screen? And I don't think you're ever going to see a better depiction at the end of that movie. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been that high, but I've seen people that are, and their experience is not dissimilar. My sense about Scorsese is that he plans meticulously what goes into a shot, but then whatever happens within that, he'll allow to unfold in a real way, and he'll collaborate with the performers, and he'll cast the right people. You forget how good an actor De Niro is. You forget how amazing he really is in that film and how he just embodied Jimmy Conway just dead on the money. It's a prime example of how De Niro uses no words to outact somebody, you know. He can be in a scene and just like, you know, you can feel his presence and, and know what he's thinking and know what he's about to do and know, and know everything about him without him talking that much. De Niro's eyes are his greatest weapon in his acting arsenal. You know what I'm talking Yeah. Ray Liotta, who was more unknown at the time, was the best person for that part. Now take me to jail. Even I don't think De Niro or any other actor in the movie could have that kind of awestruck enthusiasm. enthusiasm. Yeah. Pesci's performance was the obvious great one. Those guys always still the show, the, the flashy killer. It's a wing. <laughs> the reaction for black audiences, Joe Pesci was the star. It wasn't Ray Liotta. It wasn't, you know, De Niro. Joe Pesci was the star. What Paulie and the organization does is offer protection for people who can't go to the cops. Paul Sevier doesn't say anything for half the movie. And he doesn't play it mean. You don't see him scowling. If there was something I could do, don't you think I would do it? You know me, I would like to help you out. Most people would lean into that performance. He plays it very relaxed. I straighten this thing out. I know just what to say to her. He plays so against what you think the thing would be. The actors aren't acting, you know, with a capital A. They're behaving. They're acting real in that moment. And so you feel like you're watching some truth here. You can point to certain performances that look so effortless. Benny, what happened? Did we get straightened out? No, we had a problem. You think, my God, it just looks like they weren't even trying. And you know they were. That's it. What do you mean? What do you mean? Uh, he's gone. He's gone. He has a family of actors that he's known for a while, and he knows who they are and what part they'd be great for and how to let them do their thing. Freeze! Freeze! Don't you move, you motherfucker! I'll blow your brains out! So Goodfellas has oh. its own sort of approach to violence, not glorifying it, but showing it for what it really is and letting the violent act be horrible because it is. It's a messy scene. It's not neat, you know, it's like really sloppy and that cut of De Niro going, you know, his foot misses and he hits him one time, he misses again. It's, it's like real violence. What's the world coming to? You're not safe in this film. You know, Henry's not safe in this film. Anytime you can create that level of dread, it's just seamless. I've always admired the realism of the violence, that it seems kind of hard-earned, if that's the right word. It's like, it's not gratuitous. There's never a time someone's getting killed that ultimately you don't know why. I think it's easy to say Scorsese is by far the most influential filmmaker of the last 40 years, both in the sheer joy of cinema, wanting to make films, that's what I felt from him. But then in the language of cinema, I mean, he sort of redefined pacing, editing, how you can push boundaries and stuff, all within narrative context. When we first did our first movie, Men's Society, we, we were looking for a movie to mold it after while we were doing the script and we went straight for Goodfellas. Every single Sunday during the entire shooting of Shawshank Redemption, I watched Goodfellas. Why? 
for the sheer inspiration that it provided me. You point him out for the members of the jury. As a young filmmaker, you see those movies and it gives you that shot in the arm to go, you know what? This is what I love. This is what gives me a heartbeat. I want to make movies like that. I'll do whatever I got to do to do that. If we wanted something, we just took it. If anyone complained twice, they got hit so bad, believe me, they never complained again. Goodfellas started that whole 90s sort of retro lounge culture. Certainly in Swingers, we, we borrow a lot from it. Not that we were making that movie, but that our characters thought they were living that movie. Goodfellas spawned The Sopranos. You know, the mob can be quirky and funny and real and accessible. If you look at the main cast of Sopranos, about half those people you could see in Goodfellas. There's a lot of guys sort of there in the background that come to the forefront. And you had Nicky Eyes. What's up, guy? 20 years from now, it's still going to be a classic. 20 years from now, people will still be talking about it. This is the finest kind of art. It just looks so effortless, doesn't it? It's just like great literature. It's like a fantastic book you've read that always sticks with you. That's how I feel about that movie. We ran everything. We paid off cops. We paid off lawyers. We paid off judges. Everybody had their hands out. Everything was for the taking. You know, it's not the American dream. It's, it's anything but the American. It, it, it would be the American nightmare. You know, people ask me how accurate was that movie. I mean, that movie was, to me, 95%, 99% accurate. I mean, it's just amazing how he was able to capture it, you know? And not only capture me, but capture that whole life that I was in, the whole part of society. Well, the, the guys in, in, in Goodfellas are sort of your everyday, kind of low-level, um, sort of day-to-day -day guy who's just trying to get ahead. But basically, if you look at their day, th their work never stops. They don't work eight hours or ten hours a day. They're always on. They're always working. And ultimately, I don't know that they're actually that far ahead at the end of the day than, the, you know, the sort of working stuff. Uh, so they're, they're working like an 18-hour day or 24-hour day. Come on, fuckos, let's go for a ride. <laughs> Keep them up all night. So, I mean, there was a constant hustle because we had no respect for money. Of course, we, you know, we was able to, to do whatever we wanted in that life, you know? And, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a crazy, sick existence. Once you join it, you can't leave. Henry got a taste. He had it all. How do you go back? How do you tell your wife you got to give in the, the, the no more Copacabanas, no more... $20 tips to the waiter. I mean, you can't give that up after you're in that world. And none of them can. And you had Nicky Eyes. What's up, guy? And Mikey Franchese. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, I want to see him. And Jimmy Two Times. My biggest influence was seeing guys with white on white shirts with the little pleat here, short sleeve shirt, with the two buttons and their initials on over here. And custom made clothes and the pinky rings. The guys were as sweet as the women in terms of the way they looked. Women dress, but the men dress also. They peacocked. And um, they would have $1,000 gin games after hours. Slick guys. In organized crime, the idea is not to go around killing people. It's, it's um, to make a lot of money for the least amount of effort. And as soon as the deliveries are made in the front door, you move this stuff out the back and sell it at a discount. Henry and those guys don't think of themselves as being crooks. They think of a guy as ambitious. The guy's got guts. He goes out there. He's trying to make something. He's trying to earn which is an interesting thing to, to call somebody who's using a gun to get the money. But they don't refer to it, I'm gonna go out and rob some money. I'm gonna go out and earn. That's what they think of that as enterprise. You know, I grew into it. I mean, to me, it was normal. You know, I mean, everything normal about that life was so uh, diametrically opposed to the way normality is. We were evil, we were brutal, uh, immoral. And you, you gotta take it easy. You got children. I'm not saying you gotta go back there this minute. But you gotta go back. I mean, it's the only way. Almost as if to balance the destruction they create. They're fierce about their families. Whoever is close to them uh, are the closest people in the world to them, and they are extraordinarily devoted. And their priorities, while maintaining an extraordinarily human side, are so foreign to the average human being. Anyway, you know what reminds me? I need this knife. I'm gonna take this, it's okay? Okay, yeah, I just need it for bring it while. back, though, you know. Because this is a kind of person to do things that perhaps there's an inkling in all of us to do. What the fuck are you looking at? You're a fucking, <laughs> you're a fucking moron. You don't want to bring the check. Certainly, in our lives, we've sat there when people were doing things we hated and said, I wish you could die. We've all felt it. On, fuck, keep that motherfucker here. Go. Keep him here. Go. Keep him here. Come on. I think you and I might find it difficult to take a baseball bat to someone's head 
over an issue. Why don't you go fuck yourself, Tommy? They mouth off at him, and he shoots them. You can let this fucking punk get away with that? What's the matter? What's the world coming to? So that kind of power, without constraint, is appealing. Excuse me. Yeah? Spookbag. We find them absolutely impossible to resist, because they can do, it seems, whatever they want to do. You're going to go ahead first. I mean, it looks real good on the screen, but if they ever had to live one day the life that I lived, you know, I don't think any of these kids that want to be wise guys today or, or go that route in life that they'd want to do it on a steady basis because, I mean, I was scared shit every day of my life because I'd wake up every morning wondering if it was going to be my last day, the last time I see the sunrise. The stuff that was going on, I mean, knowing, knowing that I was close to death so many times. That's when I knew I would never have come back from Florida alive. You know, and not wanting to really believe that, you know, these people would kill me but seeing my best friends and their best friends getting killed by them. Anything went, you know, and that's, you know, and that was everybody around me. Well, that, that's the tragedy of the lifestyle. See, that's why I think it's so tragic. And one has to understand, and very often there's an emphasis on, in the movie of weddings, uh, christenings, birthday parties. By the end of the film, you begin to realize, at the beginning of the film, all these people in, in around the table sharing in the delight of the wedding or the christening or whatever, well, all these people are later um, killed. By, uh, by one or two of the other people in the same picture. Imagine opening an old book of your own family and saying, well, there's Uncle Joe. Oh, gee, he killed, he killed everybody in this shot. You know, and you live moment to moment, you know, and you didn't care, you didn't think about the future. You know, you live for the present. I made $12,000 in my second week. I had a down payment on my house and things were really rolling. All I had to do was every once in a while was tell Sandy that I loved her. Joe Pesci always points out, he said the, the life cycle of, of, of one of these wise guys or good fellows, whatever, whatever you want to call them, uh, usually said this eight or nine years, seven to eight or nine years before, either A, they, they go to jail and start that long process of going to jail, spending time in jail, dealing with the family outside of jail, and going, coming back out and then going back to jail, a revolving door with the jail, or uh, being killed. Because it's, it's, um, it's just the law of averages. It just can't go ahead after a period of time. It's just, it just can't be. See him here in the courtroom today, Yes. Could you please point him out for the members of the jury? You know, sitting in a courtroom testifying against them it was, uh, you know, I got you before you, you got me. I mean, they didn't get me with a bullet. I got them with the, uh, you know, with the arm of the law. It was, it was difficult. I mean, it was totally, you know, it was, it was, it was horrible. But uh, it's just how it had to end. His agreement with the government was that if he was caught in one lie, he was out of the program and back in prison, where he would be dead in about an hour and a half. So I've never, I've been a reporter all my life, I've never been in a position where the man I was talking to's life depended upon telling the truth. It's as close a look at that world as you'll ever get from somebody who actually lived it. I, I feel today so detached from that lifestyle and from that, uh, that whole existence of Henry Hill. There's certain aspects of that life I'd, I'd be a liar if I says I didn't miss, but you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm so grateful uh, that I, I was given a second chance and that my life did turn out uh, the way it has. Will you take part in my life, my love? Another letter from that school goes to that kid's house. In the fucking oven, you're gonna go ahead first. That was it. No more letters from chewing officers, no more letters from school, in fact, no more letters from anybody. Like, like an ending day, what do you want? This guy's worried about it. he didn't want to come over and get the check, you know. Just, Wait he could take care of this shit. Yeah, it's no problem. Don't put it on my tab. I thought you had one of your bitches in here. Yeah, I did. Where the fuck is he? <laughs> so we got these hot books around, though, or a bitch or something. Damn it. It's 11.30, you're supposed to be here, you know, we're supposed to be there by 9. Shit, I'll be ready. Yeah, you're always fucking late. You're oh, late fuck. for your own fucking funeral. <laughs> as far as Jimmy was concerned, with Tommy being made, it was like we were all being made. We would now have one of our own as a member. Do you love her? 
And it's worth it, isn't it? Is this the same baby you used last week? No, that one was my sister's. This is Deirdre's. Oh, big young. She looks just like you, Lois. I want you to do your part. Come here to my open arms. my fucking mother if you touch her again you're dead oh. 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 I did my fucking time. I did my fucking time. I kill all, and I want what I gotta get. I got fucking mouths to feed. You're gonna get it. You understand? You're gonna get it. Yeah, I'm gonna. That's That was the first time I'd ever seen anyone shot. But after a while, he was mostly pissed because I hung around the cab stand. And every once in a while, I'd have to take a beating. The way I saw it, everybody takes a beating sometimes. I swear to Christ, I'll get the money. And we got to spend the rest of the weekend at the track. Yeah, they mean business. Then, I couldn't believe what happened. When we got home, we were all over the newspaper. People looked at me differently. Our neighbors didn't park in our driveway anymore, even though we didn't have a car. I mean, at 13, I was making more money than most of the grown-ups in the neighborhood. I mean, I had more money than I could spend. I had it all. One day, one day some of the kids from the neighborhood carried my mother's groceries all the way home. You know why? It was out of respect.